and ask, how many went to a family gathering? I, better, I won't ask that question. <laughs> oh, you did. See, now there's a brave soul. She said, I am tired of being locked in my house. Right? I, you know, we need fellowship. Isn't that true? So anyway, uh, I went to Flagstaff. I was just telling Mark, because I might have a daughter up there. In fact, that was Mark's old stomping ground. Uh, my daughter hasn't forgotten it. <laughs> anyway, but we only had four people there, her, her son and daughter, and uh, of course, her husband, and, and then it was us too. So anyway, I was talking about going to Flagstaff. And so, so that's where we spent Christmas. And so, you know, it's, it just isn't right to celebrate without people around, is it? It just isn't the same. It just isn't the same. Yeah, and Robert, Robert, well, yeah, Robert's waiting for me to, to apply that to the potlucks. <laughs> and the way it's going right now, I think I would be more than happy to be at a potluck, I can tell you. Right. Well, anyway, Merry Christmas. We got a new year coming, and we hope that uh, 2021 will be a little bit better. And so this morning we're going to talk about, we're going to continue, or I should say conclude, our lessons on education. And so this morning we're going to be talking a little bit about an education in heaven. You know, the lesson talks about the fact that when Jesus comes, we all should have a bachelor's degree in the knowledge of Jesus, right? And then when we get to heaven and the earth made new, we will do postgraduate work, right? Which never ends. I actually know some students are what they call career students. You ever heard of those? I would say, yeah, I have one in my house, as a matter of fact. He's only 58. He, he still isn't sure what he's going to be doing. But <laughs> anyway, good morning. So anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about that. And uh, have you ever heard the story or the saying that they're so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good? That's going to be our opening statement today <laughs> and so forth. Because as I read the Bible and we look at Isaiah 65 and 66, Revelation 21, Revelation 22, and you could go on and on, it talks a lot about materialistic things, does it not? And so forth. And I'm going to read a statement, if I may, and it should be right up there. No, it isn't. All right. There's a statement, and I think it's from Christ's Object Lesson, so let's see. Ah, that's not what I want. Well, let's do this. Let's do this first, then we'll go to that statement. Okay, this is from Great Controversy, page 678. Let's take a look at this. It says, after the years of eternity, as a roll, will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ, and so forth. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and I love the third part, happiness will increase. Okay, I love to hear that part, right? The more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of his character. As Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements and the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransom thrill with more fervent devotion and with more rapturous joy. They sweep the hearts of gold and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of others unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise. Now let me ask you this. We read in the Bible that Jesus, many times, spent all night in prayer. That it used to bother me because of the fact I didn't come close to that. In fact, about 20 minutes in, I was having that Peter Gethsemane experience of fatigue. And I kept, after 20, 25, I didn't have anything else to say. So one guy says, look, you know what, when you pray, Sometimes we forget of all the needs and the concerns and some of the good things that have happened. Write them down and have that book when you're kneeling there and you just look at those and go down the list. Well, that's pretty effective. Have you ever, have you ever tried that? So you open the book up in your closet. You want to do this on a, when you're giving grace at the meals. You want to do this. I better, <laughs> we better put some emphasis on that. We do this when we have our compartment in prayer, because that's the most important part of prayer, is when we have a time alone with, with God. And I'd open that up and so forth, which kind of eliminated the closing of the eyes when you have prayer, but I would go down the list. And you know what? 20 minutes went by pretty quickly. 25 minutes, 
because I was bringing to my remembrance of things I remember. You remember saying, if you ever said something, I'm going to pray for you, and what happens is you don't. And sometimes because you forget. Put it in a book. Write it down. Good morning. Good to have you with us today. And so forth. This man looks familiar. <laughs> At my age, a lot of people look familiar. Who does that look like to you? He looks like someone who shouldn't be married, but he is. <laughs> ah, now there's a compliment. Huh? It is. Doug, good to have you with us. You know what? I know Doug's name, but I don't know his wife's name. Kent. Kent. Oh, there we go. I can remember that. Okay. One guy said, why didn't you ever go into the ministry? I said, because I don't remember names. That's a good reason. Huh? So what was others, but that's one of them. So well, good to have you with us. Thank you for being here. And Doug, I want to tell you, I listened to your program a lot when we didn't have church, I can tell you. I was on ABN and listening to your sermons, or your, your Sabbath school with your associate, and enjoyed that very much. So thank you very much. And a point in time of our lives, we had something, we had a resource we could go to. All right, let's go ahead and talk about this. This is our question, and let's go back to the first slide, if I can find it. Okay. We'll make a statement here by the great controversy. A fear of making the future inheritance seems too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. And so forth. And I know when I look at things, I look at the materialistic side of it. Do you? And so when we read, and here's a question, then we'll come into this. In thinking of the material things that heaven brings, are they relative to our looking forward to living there? Are they not relative to looking forward to the kingdom? Should they have any input whatsoever? What do you think? We're going to have material bodies. We're going to live in the New Jerusalem. I mean, these are all material things, but we get to keep the most special things and all the fails and comparisons to what we're going to be doing. Okay. When you look at the description of the New Jerusalem, the gold streets, the, the gates that are pearl, and we go on and call it, if I had a house like that, people would say, you know, as a Christian, you're kind of extravagant. Right? But when God prepares something for us, he gives it his best shot. Would you agree? And why does he do that? Why does he go to such degree in materialistic things? I thought we weren't supposed to be interested in those things. That's a thought, isn't it? And I'm trying to read spiritually how we can apply that to how we live today. You know, when, you know, just before Jesus went to Gethsemane, his disciples were still having their struggle about who was the greatest. And he says one of the finest things, let not your heart be troubled. You trust in God, I want you to trust in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, or if you want to use the King James, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Why would he bring up that materialistic theme of a mansion? Okay. Okay. You know, we were talking, uh, Robert and I were talking a few minutes ago, you know, living here is like being at the Motel 6. No offense, Matt. Going to heaven is like staying at the Four Seasons. And that's probably a bad example. But in essence, it is, there is joy in beautiful things. Is that true? And we enjoy those things, whether it be in nature, whether it be other things. Yeah, exactly. Look. Yes. Yeah.
in my mind, I, just, I that's the way I pictured it. I picture being in a house where there's like a stream running through your house. Or yeah. A little waterfall or a, a tree. I mean, I don't know. Well, there's no question that probably the person we really want to see when we get there is, is Jesus because we wouldn't be there without him, right? Uh, he's our righteousness. He's everything. And, you know, when people talk about preparation for heaven, the thing is, is the preparation continues in heaven, is it not? Of knowing Jesus. That is the gospel message, knowing Christ. Isn't that right? That's what our theme has been. By staying connected and knowing him is the key to success in life uh, and so forth. So let's go on and let's take a look at this. Here are a couple of texts out of Revelation 21 and 22, which is a description, of, first of all, of the New Jerusalem. And we're looking at the finest metals. We're looking at pure gold. We're looking at, I mean, you look at all of these things and so forth that God has made for you and I. To me, it is a show uh, to us of the fact that he loves and wants us to be happy in heaven. And this is part of it. This is part of it. Number two, it says here, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. Okay? We don't talk enough about the New Jerusalem. I'm trying to think the last time I heard a sermon about what the New Jerusalem looked like, about the fact that we will build and someone else will not inhabit. I always looked at that. I wondered about that. We'll talk about that a little later. Yes. Yeah, words cannot explain. Jesus would probably like to have disclosed that, but we just wouldn't have grasped it. It's just so magnificent. I think we sometimes, maybe that's why some people don't want to be Christians, because we painted it so gloom that they have no desire to be there. Right? And so forth. So when I think about people who aren't going to be there, which is a tragedy, because we won't all be there, but for them, in an unconverted heart, it would be hell to them. Isn't that right? So God, in his grace and his love, even for those who are not saved, has a mission of mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's some people's idea. Well, you know, uh, I, you know the survey I take. Being a consultant, I have this survey, which is very unscientific, as you know, and so forth. And the survey is, when I'm on an airplane, and sitting by someone who has to be at least 40, I don't check the driver's license, but, you know, I kind of take a look at him and say, well, now see, I would look at, you know, over here and say, well, you know, this man isn't old enough for this question. But, uh, <laughs> dog, uh, no. But uh, anyway, the thing is, at... I'd ask him this question. If you could be 21 again, not knowing what you know today, would you do it? Now, some of you haven't heard the response to this, because I actually kept a tab tabulation. What percent do you think said, no, I wouldn't do it? Anyway, any, get, you can't, you know the answer already. What do you think? Pardon? Okay, pretty close. Anybody else want to give another shot at it? You should know. <laughs> well, I'd give you a set of keys for a Volkswagen. That's about all I could give you. Okay. Well, at least you're yeah, safe, huh? 90% said I would not want to be 21 again. I would always want to, how would you have answered that question? Probably with stipulations, I suppose, huh? Do you think it would really make a difference? Probably not. 
<laughs> now, I'm not a counselor, but I have talked to many pastors who have spoken with many people who have many difficulties. And a woman would divorce her husband, let's say, and she'd be merely, and she'd be merely the same type of individual that she divorced. Now, maybe that's not a good trend, but would we really be all that different? So I'm going to come back to you. Why would somebody say, I wouldn't want to go back and start at 21? Why? What does it tell us about life? At least in the heart of about 90% of the people we interviewed. There's a lot of hurt. There's a lot of sorrow. There is a lot of pain. Yeah. Pardon? Well, I, um, I, my folks used to say that, and it's a lot worse now than when they were here. So it, it seems like it's getting progressively worse, yes, I would say. Bob? Okay. See, Bob was one of those Elvis guys. So forth. So, so was I. <laughs> It was, I have to admit, you know, the only thing we ever worried about was whether we had a full milkshake and a hamburger. Politics wasn't involved. We didn't care about any of that, you know, uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, get, when we watched TV at night, we watched Ozzy and Harriet, you know. I said that one time in a large group, and somebody thought it was some kind of a drink and so forth. So you always have to, you know, I show how old we're getting here. But uh, it was simple. It was a very simple life. I love simple, don't you? You don't need a lot of stuff. My parents, my dad was a custodian, my mother was a nurse's aide, uh, and so they didn't make a lot of money, but we thought we were doing well. We had no point of reference above that, and so, but life was simple, and uh, so forth. My dad and my mother were hard workers, taught us good work ethic, they were not Christians. Uh, later they would be, but uh, at that time, no. Yes, Bob? What makes you happy, Bob? Simple or not? <laughs> well, I think we can answer that with some Bible texts. Anybody? Yeah. Well, I think that we have, and I've done that myself, we've spiritualized the real joys of what heaven is going to be about uh, and so forth. And I think, not meaning to do that possibly, but I don't know what the reason for that would be. But as I studied our lesson this week, went back through all the things that God is going to do for us. I mean, being, having Jesus there alone, people say, is good enough for me. And in a sense, that's true. But God says, no, it's not. There's other things you need as well. Just like when he created Eve. What was he saying? For Adam, being with Jesus wasn't enough. He had to have someone that was compatible with him. And so he created Eve. And he was probably saying, not a bad choice. <laughs> God knows what he's doing. All right, let's go on. Let's look at Isaiah 65, 18. And when you hear the word delight or entertainment or any kind of thing like that, sometimes you get a kind of a frown uh, from Christian people. Let's read this text. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I will create. What's the emphasis on? What God has made, right? Let's go on. For I will create Jerusalem to be what? A delight, and what else? And its people, a joy. So God is concerned about our happiness. He's concerned about the fact of our joy, that it's, it's a, one of the pieces of living in heaven. And in essence, uh, we'll talk about, well, do we have that same kind of thing here? We just talked about the survey and people saying, well, you know what, I'd rather not go back. Not that great. Now, this is an interesting one. They will build houses and dwell in them. They will pr plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them. I've always looked at that and said, what in the world? Okay, well, that's a good perspective, okay. 
I was just thinking, what does God have in mind with that? That may be part of it. What else? Yes. Yep. Ah, good point. Okay. Well, do you really ever own anything in this world? The government could take that away from you so quickly with a blink of an eye. Isn't that right? So God says, that's not going to happen there. And the, what troubles me, he said, you're building. And I'm kind of looking at the earthly side of me. I have no skills in that area. Zippo. So it means not only can you be a builder, you can know you actually be part of the choir, right? God gives us those additional talents and so forth. So it's a good thing. It's a wonderful thing. It says, my chosen ones will long enjoy the work of their hands. What we do when we work, we enjoy. It's great. Now, if somebody were to ask you, do you really love your job? You have to, you don't have to answer that, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> do you really love your job? I did when I had one. Yeah. Okay. And if you had to do that for eternity, would you be more than happy to do that? I'd go back and do it in a heartbeat. Remind, remind me not to call on Bob anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I enjoy my job to a point, but my job has issues. My job has stress. Okay, you might like your job, but along with the job comes stress, does it not? Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I'm thinking. Um, well, give me that last part again. Okay, I missed it. Yeah, you would put that. Is that kind of Stephen Covey? I'm just kidding. Yeah, it is true how you handle it. But doesn't every job have difficulties? That's a whole different issue. <laughs> yeah. Well, it appears to me, and see if you agree, that the work we do in heaven will not have stress. The work that we do in heaven will be constant joy. I don't have a job like that. You do? No, I'm just kidding. You had, you had a question, I think, right? Okay. Yes, as compared to that, and that's why God, it's also better for us in staying uh, focused on where we need to be. When we're idle is where we get into trouble, right? So that's a point there. Okay, well, let's go on. We'll spend any more time on that if we can. Uh, this is kind of a map of what the New Jerusalem would look like if it was placed in the United States. We're looking all the way from Seattle, Washington, down to Fargo. I don't know. It goes all the way down to the border on the right side and all the way to San Diego. Okay? The Bible says 1,500 miles on each corner, although I've read some commentaries that say that's Roman miles. In real miles, as we calculate it today, it's about 1,377 miles and so forth. Irregardless, that's a big city, isn't it? And the nice thing is there will be no temple. What does that tell you? Because we're living next door to Jesus, right? There will be no temple. No more sacrifice for sin because there is no sin. No more carnal nature because it's been taken away when we receive immortality. Yeah. Thank you. 
the sanctuary. And he was describing the New Jerusalem as obviously a, a perfect square. Mm-hmm. Anybody want to address that? Somebody else can elaborate. <laughs> well, the Bible makes it very clear there is no temple. Not true? Okay. Because we're in heaven, sin is past, sin is gone. We can speak face to face with Jesus. Okay. And every Sabbath, as we go to the New Jerusalem and there uh, and say, be interesting. I mean, what is Jesus really like? Now, in this day, day and age, that's what our goal, that's what Jesus said, your work is to know the one whom the Father has sent. That's what your work is. I'll take care of the fruit, but you take care of staying attached to me. You do that, and you'll be just fine, right? That's always our biggest problem, staying connected, and so forth. So, let's take that and look at the second question. The question says, how does this text, we'll read it in just a minute, direct to a mind our mindset and setting or in dealing with the difficult issues of life. Here's the, here's the quotation from 2 Corinthians. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Let's just take that statement. What does that mean to you? Let's read it again. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us, this is an education, an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. This is a mindset. What do you think? What we're going through now, see if I'm summarizing her correctly, what we're going through now is nothing compared to what we will receive in the end. We can't even compare. The problem is we are Americans and we're impulse buyers. If it wasn't for that, our economy would probably collapse. But isn't that true? We're impulse buyers. I want it, I'm gonna have it. That carries through spiritually, does it not? That's nice when Jesus comes, but I want it now. Okay. Okay. I love the NIV's uh, its writings on it, Hebrews 11.1. 1. Well, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see, right? And so forth. So what is the focus on? What's coming? Yeah. Okay. That's not always easy to do. So let's finish this. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Okay? That pretty much sizes up Hebrews 11.1. 1. Okay. Now, does that work for you? Just thinking of and knowing that when Jesus comes, this will all be put, it'll be all worth what we went through. Does that work for you? Does that erase the problems? Does that get rid of the difficulties? Does that get rid of the struggle? Or that helps you get through those? In part. Okay. Well, you know, of course, it's, uh, Psalms 23 addresses that. It says, you know, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you took me out of it. 
He walks through it with us, right? It's that presence of Jesus with us and with the hope of what's coming that gets us through life. Is that a good summary or not? What do you think? Okay. Yeah. Right. But the end result is worth it. And I, I can remember after she squeezed the life out of my hand, you know, while she was in labor, and I was in such pain. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> then afterwards, I looked at it, and I'm, I'm thinking, man, you just went through that. That's just absolutely mind-boggling. Yeah. And to, you know, Isaiah was laying there on her, and, and it was just a, a precious thing. But I immediately asked her, and maybe I asked her too soon, but I said, do you think you can do that again? Yeah. <laughs> I was either expecting the, the backside of her hand. I, uh, yeah. so, but uh, she looked at me without hesitation and she said, yes. Hmm. Now, okay. had I asked that in the process, I don't know if I'd be here right now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it does give us hope that he compares it to birthing pain so yeah. much that once the child is born, you just kind of, you, you don't forget, but it's just kind of fades. Yeah. Well, I think that's true of most of life, isn't it? The things, the objectives, the goals that we have, when we reach those goals or those objectives, how great it is. But there's a lot of pain sometimes getting that. There's a lot of anxiety sometimes getting that. Uh, there's a lot of struggle getting that, okay, and so forth. So, but when we get there, we look back and say it was worth it. But you usually say that when we get there. <laughs> we don't usually say it at the beginning. We say it when we get there. And so I think of all these, you know, I, I look around the throne and we see these, these people praising God all the time. You think, how do they do that? And I said, Chuck, you just got to remember, the more we praise God is because that's how much more we know him. And the more you know him, the more you'll praise him. That makes sense, right? And so our education, we said that the basic education that God is t basically instructing us with, or the point he's trying to instruct, not only here but in heaven, is knowing him. That was his prayer in John 17, verse 3. That's what he wanted. The same relationship he had with the Father, he wants us to have with him. And that is what our focus will be on throughout eternity. Everybody agree with that? That doesn't change. The focus is the same. And the more we get to know Christ, and some people say, you know, I don't pray very long. We talked about that earlier. I, I'm, you know, prayer is tough for me. I'm, you know, I've been there 15 minutes. That's the only thing. Jesus prayed all night. Jesus knew his Father. We're still learning to know Jesus and so forth. That process takes time. No, trust is not so cheap that it can be gained in 10 minutes. Isn't that true? Yeah, Mop. Yeah, and look at the things that we're going to be seeing, and we must have a much better mind. That's a good thing, right? We can actually gather and gain more. We can, you know, all of those things will be back again. But um, I like this. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer, the one who started it all, and the one who will finish it for us. It's not, that's a wonderful promise. Wouldn't you agree? As you once walked in him, as you once accepted him, so walk in him. The Bible says in Colossians 2, 6, he says, hey, you just walk with me just like you did at the beginning, and we'll get through it, and I'll finish you with faith. And it says, for the joy set before him, it talks about him going to the cross, the shame, and everything he went through. It says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so you will not grow weary and lose heart. Has anybody ever in a, had an experience in their Christian life where you said, you know what? That's it. I, I just can't take anymore. Now, maybe you didn't do anything. It just was a passing thought even. But have you ever had that time and you said, you know what, is this really worth it? That's a tough question. Have you ever had that happen? Pardon? Okay. And why would those moments come? What caused that, you think? And in your situation, for instance, if you feel free to disclose that.
Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, apparently Paul, as he makes this statement here in Hebrews, he's saying is when we do these two things, number one is we focus on Christ, we focus on what he went through, but we keep our eyes on him. We keep associating with him through prayer, through study. We let him live within us. And as we share him and so forth, that this will help us not to lose heart. There's a lot of disappointments being a church member and being a Christian at times, isn't there? So sometimes there's things we don't like. There's controversy in the church. There's all kinds of things we can point to, you know, that would discourage us, okay, and so forth. And, uh, you know, I was talking with Pastor Dave this morning. I'd like to get your opinion on this. It's a little bit off the subject, but it's along the same line. The Christmas season, New Year's, is a very difficult time for a lot of people and probably the most difficult time of the year. Now, as Christian people, and being people that we are, we're not always charitable. We have, a, we have a bent towards selfishness, right? And so forth. And so we want to be charitable, uh, and so forth. But there's another side that we don't hear enough about, in my opinion, and see what you think. And that is this. I got 12 letters in the last four days about donations for different organizations and all of them were good one was saint jude and so forth we have a school that needs our help we have a church that has a budget deficit and all of these appeals and sometimes people have what we call need syndrome in essence the needs are so great and they feel they cannot participate in some, that they become distressed and discouraged. We need a message from Scripture that says, how do you deal with that? What do you deal with those people who are discouraged because of that? We always hear the other side, but what about that side? That's a part of life that we need to address, and so forth. I don't think I have ever, ever heard a sermon on that. Not one. And how many people do I talk to? I talk to one guy and he says, all they ever ask about is money. My folks used to say that when we were part of the Methodist church. Of course, they were not habitually going. But, uh, and so forth. What they were really saying, at least in some instances, was the burden is so great. I feel that these are necessary and important. But I can't participate in everything. I just can't. And they feel guilty because of it. How many have been in that position? Now, come on, let's be honest. All right, we need to deal with that. That's part of living. It's part of life. Yes. You just withdrew your offering. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, as one pastor told me, it's not hard to make people feel guilty. <laughs> it's very easy. <laughs> right? Yeah, Bob. Then come to your monk. Well, 
Yeah, well, it's, I think it's an issue, and I'm sure it's what we need to deal with, because I think it drives people out of the church rather than bring them in, because we don't deal with that. At least to my knowledge, we haven't. My parents were down in the Methodist church. Of course, that was a little different scenario. But there were others uh, who had the same opinion. I was a young, youngster at seven and eight years old. I remembered that. I remembered that, uh, and so forth. And, but then I think about, remember when Jesus um, was at this great feast, if you remember, and Mary comes in and she begins to wash his feet. Maybe this is the answer that's part of this issue. And Judas, and along with all the other disciples, Judas being the instigator, says, hold it, hold it, how much did you spend for that? You could have been given that to the poor. What was Jesus' answer? The poor will always be with you. What in the world was he saying? That's exactly what I think he was saying, and so forth. When we give to Jesus all we can to him, you know, he's everything for us and let the chips fall where they may, and so forth. But we do need to help people through this period of time with that. I don't know, Doug, I, I'm, I'm gonna put you on the spot a little bit. Um, do you think this is a subject that needs to be discussed a little more so people are cheerful givers and can give without a guilt complex? And that needs to be dealt with, because where would that lead if, if you constantly have that guilt complex, right? Well, we know what that's all about, don't we, huh? Uh, you know, when I, I don't want to go into that. We haven't got time to do that, but it reminds me when I first became a Christian, and, uh, you know, was trying to do everything that the Bible said to do. What should I do on Sabbath? What should I do here and there? I didn't know what it was like to have peace, because the Bible says it isn't in sanctification that you receive peace. You receive peace because you're justified, Right? Romans 5, 1 says that. So, uh, it's just something we want our people to have a clear conscience and we want our people to be cheerful givers because cheerful givers do give more. <laughs> it's just that simple. Okay, let's go on. Now, this is a statement from George Knight in his book, Exploring Hebrews. And all we're talking about here is really an education. An education of knowing Jesus. Problems drives us to the cross. Would you not agree? Difficulties drive us to the cross. That's one of the reasons we have them. It drives us to the cross. Okay, let's take a look at this. We're going to break this down a little bit. Total dedication implies that a person will cast aside all encumbrances that might hinder the winning of the race. Hebrews admonishes Christians to lay aside every weight. Now, I want you to hear the next statement. You may or may not agree with George on this, but here's what he says. This phrase does not refer to sin which the author will treat in the next clause. So this laying aside of encumbrances or of things that we're performing, it's not that they're sinful, but they occupy too much, to occupy too much of our time that keeps us from connecting to Jesus. Let's think about that for a moment. Yes. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Happens to me all the time, what can I tell you? <laughs> okay, what is it like? Now, you know, I like sports. Anybody here that doesn't like sports? Go ahead, Patsy, it's all right. <laughs> I love sports. Yeah, yeah, well. I found out that fellowship, lack of fellowship in a sports event is not good either. You ever watched a football game with no fans? It's not the same, right? Plus, there's no home court advantage uh, from that perspective. But anyway, this. She remembered your question. Yeah, well, oh, you did. Okay, good. I don't stand 
it. My daughter can do that. I listen to her and her brother speak the whole the time I'm listening all day long. But this counts for the <laughs> uh, Well, there's probably many of you could answer that question better than I could, uh, and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, there's a statement in the Spirit of Prophecy that talks about uh, spending one hour each day, and uh, you know, and some people actually, it's 4.30 or it's 8 o'clock, whatever, uh, as soon as they got that hour and they're happy. Forget the time. <laughs> Forget the time. The thing is, Take time, but don't put a time limit on it one way or the other. Just go in and study the Word of God and get to know Jesus and just take your time. If you're at 10 minutes, okay. You always start off the day with Him. Take some time with Him. You need a lot of time and so forth. And we got about a third to a lesson, yes. So, anyway. Well, I, I really did. Seventy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We're running out of time. Is that not true? It's not true. Yeah. Just remember. Oh, Mark, go ahead. Going back to the very beginning of the lesson, we talked about Jesus spending all night in prayer. All night. Well, it gets kind of back to a works type of thing. If I do this, then this will happen. If I do this, you know, of course we all have priorities. We have things we know we need to do and not do. But the point is we miss the whole issue. When we start putting time limits on it, we start, it takes away. You know, when you have a relationship with a, with a person, I'm on, I, I used to I used to use my wife all the time. You know, I had a curfew. Your wife gave you a curfew? Her parents did. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, credibility takes time to build, isn't that right? Uh, and so forth. But you know what? I wasn't overly concerned, you know, if we spent an hour talking to one another, two hours, or three. Why? Because I enjoyed being with her. And I look at that because the Bible uses the bride and the groom as a relationship issue or example of Christ and his people. And I think, you know, that Jesus prayed all night because he knew his father so intimately that he just enjoyed that time. And if for us, you know, we say, I don't, you know, it's because you still, still don't know him well. That doesn't mean you're not lost, but it means you have a long way to go to grow. And we'll have all eternity to do that. And so forth. So it helps me to understand when, my, you know, I, I need to spend more time in the Word. I know that because of the fact that, and we'll just do this as a closer. John, the sixth chapter, verse 28 and 29. What a question. It's one of the best texts, I think, one of the best texts in the Bible. 
a group of Jewish people came to him and said, probably leaders, what work must we do that we might do the works of God? They were talking about two kinds of works. Number one is, what work must we do that we can actually act like Jesus, that we can actually behave like Jesus, that we can be motivated like Jesus? They said, we've tried it, it doesn't work. Well, that's a good point. That's, 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 that's a good thing. So what must we do that we can do those things? And Jesus says, the work that you must do. So when the Bible talks about work in judgment, this is exactly what it's talking about. The work that you must do is to know the one whom the Father has sent. A knowledge of Christ is our objective in life, in the church, in every day we live, is a knowledge of Jesus. So that's where devotions become in. That's where prayer comes in. And ultimately, as we get to really know him, we'll want to share him with others. It shouldn't be forced. Yeah. Here's some other counsel for you. Number one, get a Bible that you can understand. Okay? Most scriptures today, most modern tra- are very, very good. I mean, I use a combination. I'm New Revised Standard Version. I like NIV and so forth and so forth. Uh, if you're reading, my dad, when he became a Christian, he had a King James Bible. And nothing against the King James Bible, but it was written three or four hundred years ago. And the language in there, you almost have to take a, you know, a separate class to understand because the language has changed. He could not understand it. And you know, the devil's trick is to make sure that you don't understand Scripture. Today we live in a life where there's no excuse for us not understanding Scripture, if there was ever a time. So get into a translation that you can understand. Use multiple translations. Okay? Three languages. It's embarrassing. How many do we know? One? Barely. So make sure you get into something you can understand. The word's important. And so forth. And to pray. And just remember this. All Jesus is asking is to stay connected to the vine. Isn't that right? You do that, and you'll be just fine. All right? All right, we're going to close with that. I'm sorry we didn't get to the 80% of our lesson, but that happens. And so forth, thank you very much for your input. I appreciate that, and I hope you have a nice holiday season. Let us pray uh, as we begin. Father, we do give thanks again for Jesus and his love. We give thanks that we can boldly come before the throne of grace because you care and you're concerned, and you did everything you could to save us. So we pray that in this holiday season that we'll remember that the greatest gift that could be given that you provided for us. Help us to grow and to mature. Help us to share your love with others that we might hasten your day. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you very much.